In the last video, we talked about how you can use Jesus stories to share the word of truth with your Latter-day Saint neighbors. Let's build on that and I'll use two more topical examples. Remember that it's great to transition into these by asking, uh, do you enjoy reading the New Testament? Do you enjoy the four Gospels? Um, and then as topics come up, you can ask, what in the four Gospels did Jesus say about that? Or what in your view did Jesus say about that? And if there's a kind of awkward, I don't know, you could say, hey, would you mind if I shared a Jesus story with you? Or do you remember when Jesus said? So those, that's the transition here. The two other topics here are the temple and um, family. So let's think about the temple. When the temple comes up, I love to ask, in your view, what did Jesus in the four Gospels say about the temple? Uh, what, what, to your memory, did Jesus say? And I'm, I'm emphasizing say here because I don't want them to jump off into kind of general descriptions of their larger theology. What did Jesus actually say about the temple in the four Gospels? Uh, do you remember in the Gospel of John when Jesus comes to Jerusalem and he cleanses the temple? Um, and having cleansed the temple, turned over the tables of the money uh, exchangers, um, the authorities at the temple say, what right do you have to do this? What sign will you do to show that you have the authority to do this? Um, and Jesus says, tear down this temple and I will raise it up in three days. And I'd love to pause here and ask, and what temple was Jesus speaking of? And a lot of Latter-day Saints know, and you can include them here in the conversation and they could respond. Or if they don't know, you could tell them. The temple, John the, narr the narrator says in John 2, the temple that Jesus was speaking about was his body. Now, two chapters later in John chapter 4, when Jesus is in Samaria talking to the woman at the well, uh, they have a very uh, neat and adorable exchange. It's, it's very quick, great for conversational evangelism illustration where he goes, Jesus goes from 0 to 60 and he's having a great short-term quick conversation with somebody, but he uh, beautifully starts this conversation and they end up talking about, uh, the woman asks Jesus, uh, should we worship God you know, on, in the place that our ancestors have prescribed or should we worship in Jerusalem? And Jesus, do you, remember, do you remember what Jesus says? He responds by saying, woman, I'm telling you the truth. The hour is coming and it's already here. When the worshipers of God, they won't worship on that mountain or in Jerusalem. They will, uh, God is seeking worshipers to worship him in, in spirit and in truth. Jesus says, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So not that mountain, not this mountain, not in Jerusalem, not spatially here or there. Why? God is spirit and we're going to worship him in spirit and in truth. The hour is coming, it's already here, hmm. In the, in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, when Jesus' disciples are picking heads of grain and uh, the Pharisees are really upset that they're doing this, and G Jesus gives an illustration for why they should see Jesus and his followers as quite uh, uh, able and appropriate and proper to do this. Jesus says, don't you remember uh, in David when he entered the temple and he ate, you know, of the showbread, he and those with him. Uh, Jesus ends this story by saying, I love this phrase, you can say it slowly, something greater than the temple is here. Later on in the Gospel of Matthew, when they're, um, during Holy Week, when they're uh, leaving Jerusalem one evening, the disciples say to Jesus, Jesus, look at the magnificent, glorious, beautiful building, the temple, the structure. Look at it. It's so pretty. It's, it's amazing. Jesus responds by saying, not one stone will be left standing on another. So arriving here at the very end, at the cross, while Jesus cries out with his final breath, the, the curtain or the veil of the temple, the gospel says, was ripped in half from top to bottom. And as I share that, a lot of Latter-day Saints don't remember it or, or some are kind of vaguely familiar with it. The, you know, Jesus is on the cross, the veil of the temple is torn in two, and I stop and I like to ask, what do you think that means? What, what, what's the significance of that? And then go back and review. Hmm, 
Tear down this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. Something greater than the temple is here. The hour is coming and it's already here. When the, They won't worship on this mountain or that mountain. The Holy Spirit is to be given something greater. The veil of the temple torn in two. So then I love to transition to Hebrews, which says that Jesus has opened a new and living way for us to enter the presence of God through the veil that is his flesh. So lastly, the category of family. The family is extremely important to Latter-day Saints. If you ask Latter-day Saints, what's one of the best reasons to be a Latter-day Saint? A common answer is they get to be with their family forever uh, in the afterlife. That's a good conversation question. What's the best thing about being a Latter-day Saint? Anyway, when this topic of family comes up, I love to respond with the question of, in your view, what did Jesus say about the family? In the four Gospels, to your memory, what did Jesus say about the family? And uh, then you could help your Latter-day Saint conversation partner revisit what Jesus said about the family. Um, Jesus says, if anyone wants to be his disciple, he must uh, hate his own father and mother and wife and children. Comparably, Jesus says elsewhere, you must love him more than your own family. Somebody said to Jesus, Jesus, I want to come follow you, but first, can you wait for me? I have to go bury my own father. And Jesus says, go let the dead bury the dead or, and come follow me. Uh, when Jesus was uh, in a house teaching, barely even able to eat because the crowds are pressing in and there's so many opportunities to heal and to teach, uh, his, mo his mother and his uh, stepbrothers uh, a we're trying to get a hold of Jesus, and they, and they had someone say, Hey, Jesus, your, your family's looking for you. Jesus responds by saying, Those who do the will of my Father in heaven are my mother and my brother, and so forth. Jesus reorients the whole family around, ultimately, those who do the will of his Father in heaven. When the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, uh, Jesus, can I divorce my wife for any cause? They're abusing a passage from Deuteronomy. Jesus says, have you not heard it written uh, that God has made them male and female and the two shall become one flesh? What God has joined together, let no man separate. And the way the disciples respond is incredible. They say essentially, well then why should anyone get married? That's it's, it's kind of like a, a mortgage contract. If you know you have a 50% chance of uh, defaulting on your mortgage, you're going to get a mortgage. If, if, the, the, if the ethics of marriage and divorce for Jesus are so severe and so strict, why should we even consider marriage? And Jesus' response is, well, you should consider the eunuchs. <laughs> some are eunuchs by birth. Some are made eunuchs by other men. Some are eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. Let he who will hear it, hear it. And then lastly, uh, when Jesus is approached uh, as with a trick question. During Holy Week, they're trying to trick Jesus up. So they ask Jesus, uh, hey, I got a scenario for you. There's a lady who has a husband who dies. So she marries his brother, and there's a succession, I think, I think six or seven men who become his, uh, her uh, husband. Uh, maybe she was a terrible cook, I don't know. Um, but they, they keep dying, and they ask Jesus, um, which one will she be married to at the resurrection? And Jesus responds by saying, you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. At the resurrection, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Whew, wow. Uh, but they shall be as the angels. So in review, Jesus says, go let the dead bury the dead. If you want to be his disciples, you need to hate your father, mother, wife, and children, which means love him more and be willing to renounce everything for Christ. Uh, G Jesus, when uh, told his mother and his, his uh, step-siblings are looking for him, he says, those who do the will of the Father in heaven are my true family. Um, Jesus speaks about marriage and divorce so severely and so strictly that when the disciples respond reasoning that it's perhaps better not to get married, Jesus does not correct them, and he uplifts the celibate single life of a eunuch as a beautiful kingdom way of living. And then 
he speaks of the power of God and of Scripture, painting a picture of our resurrection life as not needing uh, earthly marriage to continue into the resurrection. Uh, he says, we will neither marry nor be given in marriage. We shall be as the angels. So I love after um, I've condensed the way I share that story to you, but I love if God will, would permit uh, to be able to share those stories of my Latter-day Saint conversation partner, um, slowly, interactively, if possible, and then to end with. So in review, given what Jesus says about family in the four Gospels, how would you describe the teachings of Jesus um, on family? Uh, if you were in a prison cell and all you had was the New Testament for a couple years and all you read was that, what impression would you come away with? What is Jesus' view of the family and how it fits into the kingdom of God? Where, how does he put it in perspective? So this is really helpful for Latter-day Saints uh, because uh, they like to think of themselves as uh, the truest of Christians who value the words of Jesus. And so you, as a true believer in Jesus, get to present them with the words of Jesus, delighting in the stories of Jesus. And even if they reject it, you get to have a lot of fun doing it.